the board with T squares and triangles, we would often draw light lines that were easily erased and we called them construction lines or projection lines. Now AutoCAD has an object type that will help you do this. Now you can always use a regular line, but there are tools that are meant to be used in this way. And a lot of the times, if not the majority of the times, the line command will do exactly what you want it to do or need it to do in this case. But I wanna talk about these lines. The commands are called construction lines and rays. Now they both work almost exactly the same way. Essentially AutoCAD is drawing a line with a length that's equal to infinity. That means it extends forever, essentially. Construction lines extend in both directions to infinity. An array has a starting point and extends to infinity from there. Both are found in the Home tab. So if you go to the Home tab on your ribbon, go to Draw, you can find them right here. This is the Construction Line command. This is the Ray command. Now for me, most of the time, I'm typing in the command name for these. So for Array, type in the word Ray. Press Enter, pick your first point, then you can see my line goes to infinity. And once you start, it holds that first point and you can just keep drawing as many of these as you want. Press enter or escape or right click to finish. So if I zoom out and zoom out and zoom out like I'm doing, you can see these lines go on forever. Neither of these drawing objects affect your drawing area extents and both can be drawn in three dimensional space. And they can be a great tool for projecting lines when you're trying to create 3D models. I'm going to erase them. I'm going to show you the construction line. Now to start that command, you just type in XL or X line. Click your first point. Then as you can see, it works just the same way as the ray command, only the line goes on forever in both directions. And I can keep drawing these lines. Now let's say I have other objects and I want to use the trim command. I can select my rectangle to trim and I can just trim these just as you would any other line. Once you trim both ends or break both ends of a construction line, it becomes a line object. Now if you have a ray, you select it, see the object is called a ray. And if you break it or trim it, that leftover object becomes a line. And if you have broken it, then what's left is still a ray. Let's open up one of our example files here. Let's look at the constructionlines.dwg file. I'm going to show you a great use of construction lines. What I have here is the start of an isometric drawing. I have the front view and I have the side view. Now let's complete this drawing. So I'm going to use the ray command, press enter. I'm going to click down here right in this corner and I'm going to draw the line at a 45 degree angle. So when you draw with these objects, they work just like drawing the regular line command. So I can press tab and now I'm typing in 45. So now I have a 45 degree angle. Now this is called projection drawing. And whenever I make a projection view or I project my view, I draw a 45 degree line right here from the corner and I can extend these lines up and then where they hit this line, I can go to the opposite direction to help me create my view. So I'm going to use rays and construction lines to help me with this. So if I click on a point and I need to know where it needs to go, you can see I have my auto snap tracking on. So it helps me to draw it straight up and down. Or if I use my construction line, I can click here, then come down, make it perpendicular or parallel, whatever I need to do. Now I can extend these lines here, and as I project to the left, I get where my top view is going to have to be. Now you can also copy these items. And when working in an environment like this, that makes it very simple to draw all of my lines that I need. Now if I use the trim command, I can start cleaning this thing up. Can also match properties now for my center lines. And I can start trimming up this side as well. Let's use my match properties again. Get everything on the right layer. Now we see here that this is a dashed line. So that means there's a little cutout. And since there's a center line here, that tells me there's a little circle going on. So I'm going to start the circle command. I'm going to snap to right here and to right there. So I missed this line. So we see here in our top view, we have the edges of our objects here and here. 
We got those from using the construction lines and rays, projecting it up to the top. So this is our top view. This is our front view, and this is our side view. So our side view is nearly complete. Actually, let's break it down to there. I just need to get the little slot for this circle, even though it's not really a circle. What I'm going to do here is start the ray command, and I'm going to draw it clicking here with my O snaps, and this is where it's going to go. So I'm going to erase this line. I don't need it anymore. I'm going to use the trim command because I can trim to these two lines. So I'm going to trim my circle. And I'm going to trim that box right there. Now I can also trim these lines here. If I use this as my trimming edge, I can trim those. Makes it a little bit easier. And if I turn on F8, turn on my orthog command, it makes sure that I draw these rays or construction lines, whatever the case they are, in a straight line. Now I'm going to trim again. I'm going to do several trims at once. I'm going to trim these guys here, and I want to trim this here as well. You can see I'm trimming. Now I'm going to match properties. Make sure I get this. So I've essentially created the basics here of the rest of my top and side views using rays and construction lines. Now, when do you use a ray over a construction line? That's kind of up to you. A lot of times you can start with the ray command at a specific point so that you don't have to trim it on both sides. Sometimes you don't know where you need to trim it at on either side, though. So when you have that circumstance, use a construction line. Most of the time, though, either one's going to serve your purpose. But as you can see here, I didn't have to measure. I used basic drafting techniques with AutoCAD tools to create my other views of my object here. In this video, I want to go over a couple of rarely used commands because they're kind of very specialized. And I want to show you how to use them. There's something you can use very quickly to help you visually display things in your drawing. And they can serve a lot of different purposes. The two commands are called solid and donut. Now, the solid command isn't creating a 3D solid like your box or your cone or your sphere. This is just a two dimensional three to four point area that's been filled in. Now, the donut will create a circle or a ring, one of the two, and it'll have thickness. It'll be either a completely filled in circle or it'll have a ring around it. Now, when AutoCAD draws the donut, it's really drawing two different polylines that are arcs and they have a thickness assigned to it. And I'll kind of show you what that looks like once we draw them. But to help you out here, let's open up a file. Let's look at the solids and donuts file. This is just a simple object here. It's a little bracket. It's two different plates, each about a half an inch in thickness and about three by four inches long here. And this is a three by three box here. Now it's going to have one, two, three different holes drilled into it right into these three little spots right here. I have the center lines shown here. Now we are going to attach these two different plates just with like a quarter inch fillet weld type of a thing. And we're going to use the solids to help show where that fillet weld is at. And we're going to use donuts to kind of show where these holes are at as well. These are just two different basic examples to show you how you could use a solid or a donut. So if we start the solid command, you can just type in the word solid, press enter. Now it's kind of tricky to use because you can't really see anything while you draw it. It asks you for your first point. So you just click somewhere on the screen. So you can't see where you drew it at, so you have to be very careful with it. Then it asks for a second point. Now remember, a solid has to consist of at least three points, and it can only have up to four points. So I click my first point, my second point, now my third point. Now I'm going to click my fourth point, and it's going to draw that shape. I'm going to press Enter. Now when I select it, see it tells me it's a solid. And I can grip edit these. I can move them around and it draws them in order. So your first point, second, third, and fourth. And it's essentially going to take these four points and it connects the dots and then fills it in for you. Point one will always go to point two and three. Point two will always go to points three and four. You kind of get the idea here. So when I start the solid command again, if I want to draw a form of triangle, I pick a point, second point, and a third point, and then I press enter. So it works the exact same way, but now I just have a triangle instead of four points. 
Now, another thing you can do with solids is you can keep drawing solids. So if I pick my first, second, third, and fourth point, you see I keep going and it says specify third point. Well, it treats points three and four from your previous solid as points one and points two. So if I click here and here, see it's going to keep going. And I can just keep going until I press enter. Now, each one of these is its own object. You can see I'm selecting them one at a time. And then once they're there, I can delete them. I can erase them. I can move them, rotate them. I can put them on different layers, etc. So it's a nice way to shade an area that's not a hatch, it's just a solid, and I can do a lot of things with it. So let's say I want to show what a fillet might look like here. So this plate is about half an inch. So let's just put in a quarter inch uh, fillet weld. So I'm just drawing a circle here to kind of give me an idea at a radius of 0.25 inches. This drawing is in inches. So I need points to snap to. Here and here, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to draw in a solid, press enter, pick my first point, my second point, my third point, press enter. And I've got a good old fashioned looking fillet weld in my side view here. This is just some application that I've used in the past for a solid. You can do a lot of different things with it as well. You can fill in an area with it and you can just show it that way. Why would I do that instead of a hatch command? Good question. One reason is that it's just one command. I draw the solid, boom, it's in there, I'm done. And I know it's going to be solid. I don't have to work with boundaries and a hatch. I can just create the one simple shape and it's there. So let's look at the donut command. Just type in the word donut, press enter. You can also find the donut command here on the home tab and the draw panel. That's right here, donut. So if you haven't entered in any diameters for your donuts yet, AutoCAD will default to 0.5 for the inside diameter. Press enter, it'll default to one and you draw a donut. So you just enter, enter, and then you click where you want your donut to go. And you can put these all over the place. Now, the interesting thing about donuts is that it's not its own object. There is no donut object. I like the solid shape here. If I select it, it's a solid. But a donut is really just a polyline. And the polyline here has been made up of two different arcs and it's set to a polyline width. You can see right here, it's set to 0.25. Now these are in absolute units for your drawing. And in this case, the drawing is set up in inches. So it has a width of 0.25 units or inches. And that's how wide this is right here. Now you can manipulate these. You can copy them, you can trim them. You can also manipulate them just like you would with a regular polyline. So you can get some interesting shapes with these. They can look kind of weird. You can do a lot of different things with them. Now if you select them, you can't really change their radius because it's a polyline and you can't really do that with the polyline, not through the properties panel. Now I can change the radius here if I stretch it, but it doesn't get both sides. So if you wanna make your donut circle a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, you can use the scale command and that's gonna scale it up or down. Now if you want a donut that's completely solid, you just tell the inside radius to be zero and then you tell the outside radius to be whatever it is that you want it to be. So let's say I want one inch holes drawn in here. Well, that's gonna to be too big. Now I have my hidden lines drawn in here, so I'm going to say donut zero. And now I'm going to pick my line widths here instead of typing it in. So I'm measuring from this point to this point. So I can see my donut is going to be large enough. I'm just going to insert it at these intersection points or the midpoints of these center lines because I have it set up that way. And you can see I have these drill holes in through here now through the top view. That's another use that I've used them for, or for buttons or for just circles, targets, different things that you need to show, but you want it to be solid. And again, what's the advantage of using a donut over a hatch? Because I could draw three different circles and then put in three different hatch patterns to fill it in with a solid hatch pattern. And that works too. But again, I just have one command. I can drop it in and draw it very quickly, very easily. And it's less that I have to work with. So it's up to you. If you want to use a hatch command to fill these things in, you can. If you want to use your solid or your donut, you can do those very quickly. There's a command in AutoCAD called multi-lines. 
Multi lines are a single object, but they draw parallel lines. It's all in one command. Multi lines are composed of one to 16 parallel lines called elements, which you can define. The standard style out of the box has two elements or two lines. You can just type in ML or MLINE for multi line to start the command. And it works just like a regular line command. You pick your first point, and you can see here that you have two parallel lines being drawn. And then you pick your second point. Well, it continues on. Now, one of the cool things about it is that as you draw this multi line, you can see all the parallel lines are trimmed up to each other. And you just keep going. And when you're finished, you can just press enter, or if you type in CL for close, that'll close up your object. Now there's not a lot you can do to manipulate this. You can change your vertex locations. You can't add any more or subtract any to it. You can copy, you can rotate, you can also trim if I use the trim command here, that sort of thing. So that's the very basics of multi-lines. So let's open up a file. Let's look at the multilines.dwg file. Now in here, I've already created several multiline styles. If you type in ML style, you can see all of the different styles that I have created. This one's called new, new two, new three, new four, and standard. So whichever style you wanna use, you select it and pick the set current option. Click okay. Type in ML and you'll start drawing multilines. And you'll see with this style, the ends or the caps are arcs, and it also shades it in. So there are a lot of different things you can do with the multi-line style. Now, if I start the multi-line command, you'll notice in the command line, I have a couple of different options. I have style, and if I pick the style, I can type in the style I wanna use. If I pick justification, that's going to change my justification. Justification is at top, zero, or bottom. I'll show you a top. See, when I go to click these in, where I click, my vertex goes to the top. If I change my justification to zero, you can see my justification is at the zero setting, which means that it goes right in between the two parallel lines. And of course, the bottom justification means that the vertex will be here at the bottom. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And you can do that to create the parallel lines wherever you need to. Multi-line scale controls the overall width of the multi-line. So if I go to scale, it's in units. So that means they're going to be one unit parallel to each other. So the distance between the two parallel lines is at one unit. So if I draw one here at one unit, then I draw another one with a scale at two, see it's a little bit wider, a little bit farther apart. So those are some of the basic controls that you have over a multi-line. Now when you create name styles for multi-lines, you do this to control the number of elements and the properties of each element. If you type in again, M style, and let's create a new one. I'll give it a name here. Let's just call it test. And you can start with any of the existing styles you already have created. I'm going to start with the standard one. So I'm going to click continue. So here we have the control box for it. You can give it a description. Maybe you want it to describe something specifically. And here you have the two elements. Now the elements are treated as if your lines are offset a certain distance, that's the offset here, from the center. We have the zero justification, that goes right here. It's going to be in the middle here, and then you offset from that line 0.5 or minus 0.5. The 0.5 will mean it offsets up, and the minus means it offsets down. So you can control all of these here. And we only have two elements. If you wanna add another element, you just click add. This is going to draw one right down the middle because it's at zero. Now you have different cap settings. We saw these here, they have a rounded cap. You can make it align, and you can change the caps from the start, that means the first click or the end, so it'll include this on one or the other. You can make it an outer arc, that's what we have here. The line just squares it off, or an inner arc. I'll set these to inner arcs, and you can change the angles of them as well. You can display the joints, that means everywhere there's a vertex, so it'll have a line for the joint, and a fill color. I'm gonna make these cyan. And you can make your lines a different color as well. I'm gonna make them magenta. That's for the center line. And if I want this line to be a different color, I can. I'm gonna make it yellow. I'm gonna make this bottom one, because I want each of these to be different. We'll make white. And you can even change the line type if you want. I'm gonna leave that the same for now. I'm gonna click okay. 
And this gives you a preview of what it's going to look like. Set it current, click OK, type in ML for multi-line. You can see at all of my joints, I have that line there. When I press enter, it sort of hatched it or filled it in. So when would you use multi-lines? Well, that's a good question. Now you can use it whenever you need to draw some sort of striping, some sort of line work that's parallel. One good example might be wall buildings. If you need to draw a set of walls and you want them to be defined by certain specific colors or to be filled in, you can do that very quickly. Instead of drawing lines, offsetting them, and then hatching them, you can very quickly draw multi-lines in. Now be careful with multi-lines because there's not a lot you can really do with them. You can copy, rotate, change the vertexes, but you're going to find out that in some cases there are things that you just can't do, but there are things that you can do. The other issue you have is once you draw one, there's not a lot you can do to add to it. You can always take away, but if I try to fill it these two lines here and here, it won't work. I can't fill it those. And multi-lines can't be arcs. So you can't have a circle around. You'd have to draw a series of multi-lines going around an arc that are very short. And that's not perfect, but it's a real quick idea. So there's not a lot that you can do with them in terms of a regular line or polyline. But the biggest benefit that they give you is that you can draw a lot of parallel lines together extremely fast. So it might be a good way to very quickly draw in some pipes. It might be a great way to draw in a roadway or a sidewalk. Or if you're drawing some type of circuitry pathway, you can draw that very quickly and gives it some nice thickness or heft that you can work with. In AutoCAD, we use lines to draw things. We also use polylines. Polylines are lines with many vertexes and or segments. Splines are sinuous lines or tangent arcs. Splines can be more difficult to work with than polylines or lines, but they provide an organic design feature that you can use for your models. Let's open up a file. Let's look at the polyline-splines.dwg file. Select it, click open. So what I've done here is inserted a series of different splines and polylines for us, plus a few little points so that we can demonstrate kind of how they work. You can create a polyline very easily. Start the polyline command, type in PL on your command line, press enter, and then you just start drawing. You can go from point to point, and you can even draw in some arcs, type in A for arc, and type in L to switch back to a line. And that's how you draw a polyline. Now you draw a spline, just type in the word spline, S-P-L-I-N-E, press enter, the same sort of way. Just go from point to point, but instead of drawing a straight line, you'll see that it has a natural organic rounding radius to it. And even though these points are the same, the line created is very different. So if you want to edit a polyline, there are two different ways to do it. If you select the polyline itself, you can do a lot of different things to it through grips. Grips are these blue squares and rectangles. They may be kind of hard to see, but a polyline will have grips at the endpoints of each line segment or vertex, and it will have one right in the middle of each line. Now, when you hover over these grips, you'll get some options. You can pick stretch, and that's like you just use the stretch command and selected that line segment in your command. So if I start the stretch command and I did that, it works the same way. So that's a real nice, quick, easy thing to do. If you just pick on one of the vertexes, you can move it around, reshaping the polyline. But if you hover over one of the vertexes, you get the stretch option again. You also get an option to add or remove a vertex. So if I click add vertex, it lets me add another vertex splitting that line segment and creating two new objects inside it. Now, if I go to the remove vertex, it removes it, puts it back to just one line segment. Now, I have similar options there with the midpoint. I have stretch, as we saw earlier. I also have an add vertex. Works the exact same way. In fact, it's the one I use the most when I want to add a vertex because it kind of just grabs it right at that point, and then it allows me to manipulate it however I'd like. Of course, you have the remove vertex from the endpoints. But here in the midpoint, I have stretch, add, and convert to arc. Now, this is really nice when you want to radius your polyline. Now, once it becomes an arc, the endpoints work the same way, but then the midpoint is almost identical. You have stretch, 
add vertex, and it keeps them as an arc, and you have convert to line. So you can change these both back to a line, and I can get everything right back where it was before. So that's how you edit a polyline right there just by selecting the polyline. There's also what's called the P edit command. Type in P and then edit. That stands for polyline edit. Press enter. And through here, you can select just one polyline and you can get through these different commands. So I have open, which will open up a polyline. If I hit close, it'll make sure that polyline closes completely on itself. I can change the width. Let's give it a width of five. That changes the thickness of the polyline in units. So if you're working in inches, it'll make sure that the polyline is five inches wide. If you're working in millimeters, it'll make it five millimeters wide. So keep that in mind. Now you can also change the width down to zero, which will then just take it back to a regular line width. And that line width will then be controlled again by your layer settings, your printer settings, your object settings. You can edit a vertex through here but I don't ever use this option anymore because it's very difficult. Now with just being able to select the polyline and grip edit all the vertexes, I can do everything there that I can here. I suggest you don't do it. You can click the fit option. That kind of splines your polyline in a way, but it's still a polyline. A lot of times that's what I'll do instead of make a polyline, if I want it to be rounded. So if it's been fit like that, then you can hit the decurve button and that puts it right back to its points. Now you can spline it and that will create it into a spline. If you hit the decurve, it'll put it back. The line type gen option here will come into effect when you use a line type that is not continuous. So let's say it's hidden or something like that. So I'm going to change this line type to a dashed. Now, if you select your polyline and look at your properties palette, I'll tell you at the bottom if line type generation is disabled or not. Now, if it's disabled, it will draw the line all the way to each vertex. And so you'll always have a corner where it shows text. Now, sometimes though, this can be a problem. If you enable it, what it does, as you can see right here in this case, is that it keeps the line drawing the hatches in the appropriate spacing. So this corner could have an open space on it and you just can't see it. Now, you want to do that whenever you have a lot of short segments and you need to see the actual dashes in the lines. In this case, though, it's kind of difficult to see, but you can get an idea of what it looks like right there. You use that just whenever you need it to look one way or the other. Now, you can also use the polyline edit command on multiple polylines at a time. So you start the command, you type in M for multiple, and then you can select all of these different polylines lines or arcs. Press enter. And if you've selected objects that aren't polylines, the polyline edit command can't edit them, obviously. So AutoCAD has to convert them into polylines. And AutoCAD will ask you, do you want to convert these into polylines? And you type in Y for yes. So now all of these objects that I selected have now been converted to polylines. And I can do a lot of different things with them. I can just press the escape key. And now they're just separate polylines. You see now it says it's not an arc. It says here in the properties palette that it's a polyline. So if I type in PE, which is short for polyline edit, I can come and type in M and then I can select all of these again, press enter, and then I can pick on the join option. Press enter again, press enter again to close that out. And now I've joined all of these polylines together to make one polyline. Now, typically anymore, I find that that's what I use the polyline edit command the most for, is to join all of these objects into one polyline. Most of the other editing that I need to do in a typical day for my polylines, I can do just through the grip edits. Now, splines are very similar. We have a spline here. See, I drew the lines through each of these points, and then it just kind of arced them around, made it very sinuous. Now, I can change that in a couple of ways. If I click on this arrowhead here, it's set to a fit. Now I can switch it to control vertices. As you can see here, these lines are kind of tangential to it and everything goes inside there. And when I click on these vertices, I can manipulate the spline this way. I can always change it back to fit. And the fit means that the spline will go through those lines. Now you notice though that when I edit the splines, that it does move them in a different manner than before. 
So again, if I switch it back to the control, and it just manipulates the lines in a different way. And that's okay. Now we have a spline edit command called spline edit. And it has several settings that are very similar to our polyline edit command, but yet are a little bit different. One thing I didn't talk about on the polyline edit command is the reverse button. Sometimes you have line types that will show direction. Maybe there's text in them, an arrow or something points in a specific direction. Well, if you hit the reverse command, it reverses the polyline so that that text or whatever that special item is in that line type will look the other way. Now here you can edit your vertexes, change your fit data, you can open it, you can close it again. You can also convert it to a polyline. And through there, it will keep this roundness to it, but you have to give it a special precision. The fault is 10, and I found that that often works. So when I select it now, you see all these vertices. These are all just polyline segments now, but it had to create all of these really short segments to be able to get that arc. So that's polyline editing and spline editing tools that you can use inside AutoCAD. There are many ways to select objects in AutoCAD. There are also many ways to organize your line work. Blocks are probably one of the most common used ways to do this. With your blocks, you have all of your line work together working as one object. Blocks are great because they let you edit, reuse, and replace objects that are meant to work together. Now, there's another type of selection group called the group command. Now, the group command combines defined objects into a group, and you can name that, you can give it a couple of sets of properties, but it allows you to keep that line work together, but also allows for easy editing of the individual parts as well. Whereas with a block, you can only edit the block objects if you go into the block editor. So sometimes getting in and out can be a pain to work with. So it kind of locks them down similar to a block, but not as tightly. So let's open up a file to look at. Let's go to the movie house file and let's open it up. In this file, I've already created a few groups. When I select this row of chairs, they're grouped together. See, when I select it, in my properties palette here, it says block reference five group. I select this one, it's called block reference five group. So that's what it is, these are groups. Now it gives you a little bit of information about the specific objects, but they work as a group. That means I can move this entire row of chairs together, or I can erase them, that sort of a thing. But if I had all of these chairs together in one block, I couldn't edit the individual chairs, not without going into the block editor. So we're gonna bring all these back, reset it. You can control your groups in the home tab on the ribbon through the groups panel. Now, depending on the size and resolution of your screen, these panels may be collapsed, kind of like mine are right now. Now, if you want to go to create a group, you can just come here, and select the group option, or you can type in the word group on the command line. Now from here, you just pick your objects. So I'm going to pick these interior walls and that little door there. Press enter. So I haven't changed the line work or anything, but I've put them all in a group. So now I can move this out of the way. I can see it real quickly. I wanna put it back right now. I can erase it, delete it, you know, things like that. Now, if I try to copy, it copies the entire group. So that's another thing you can do. Now you can go to your groups panel again, and you have a couple of different options right here. This is the ungroup. If I select that and then pick my group, that group is gone, it no longer exists. If I click the group edit, I select the group that I wanna edit, and then I have the options of adding objects or removing objects or renaming it. So if I wanna add objects, I just select that, and I pick that row of chairs as well. So now, I have one group of my chairs, so it's all right here. Now if I come back up here and I select this option right here, it's group selection on off. My groups are turned off. These items are still in a group, but now I can edit one of these chairs all that I want. If I come back here and I turn group selection back on, and I select this, I'm still selecting the group minus the object that no longer exists. If I turn off this group bounding box, what happens is you'll see the entire group. It'll bring up all of these little group edits. But when I select it, it doesn't select the entire group. It lets me work with these individual pieces. So I can come back up here, turn the box back on, and now it acts as one unit once again. If 
I come back up here again and go to the group manager, I can do a lot of different things. These are my different groups that I have in this file. If I select row one and then I click highlight, that'll tell me, okay, that's row one. Click continue. I can make items be inside a group so that I can grab them in the future, but I can make them unselectable. So if I select the row I want to work with, that's this guy right here, and click the select button, it makes them unselectable. So if I click OK, and what does that mean? That means I can't pick these items as just one group anymore. Now this item is in multiple groups. They're in the row one and the row two group. Why would you want to do this? Well, because you may want to, at some point, be able to put all the items back together, grab them as a unit, but you don't want to lock them down. So putting all of the chairs in one group called chair might be a really good idea because then you can grab them all at one time, delete them very easily or quickly, or just still work with them individually. You can get really crazy with them. But I found grouping similar objects together or putting similar objects in one group, like all of the doors or like all of the plants here, etc., north face wall or eastern wall, something like that, is a great way to allow you easy and quick access to specific objects without fully locking them down with a block. So it'll allow you to work with them, control it a little bit differently. It might give you the edge that you need to get your work done more quickly or to work with large sets of data. Knowing where you are and where your model's information is, is vital in AutoCAD. Everything in life is relevant from a certain point of view. And so is AutoCAD data. AutoCAD has a world coordinate system. It's a system that's based on a Cartesian coordinate system that we commonly use in math. That's where we get our coordinates from. So if I type in the line command and I pick a point, that point is at a specific place based on our Cartesian coordinate system or our X and Y graph. The X coordinate or portion of the coordinate represents our horizontal, our left to right. The Y goes straight up and down. Now in AutoCAD, since it's 3D work actually, there's also a Z value, which is straight up and down and by default goes to zero unless you type it in. So I can draw a line to a point called zero comma zero, which is the origin of this Cartesian coordinate system. And I can go to any specific spot. AutoCAD uses what they call the world coordinate system. That is just one system that says zero comma zero comma zero is right here and everything else is relative to that point through units. And they define it as the world coordinate system. Now, AutoCAD has that so that all of our files can work with each other on one system. That zero comma zero is just an arbitrary point, but whenever we use it in file to file to file, it keeps us relative to each other in our locations. Now that really only comes into play when we're inserting other drawings into other drawings, creating blocks and copying and pasting them to our original coordinate systems, or when we're X-refing other files, they need a base point of reference. And the world coordinate system is what we use. Now, you don't always have to use the world coordinate system, though. You can customize one. You can have it to be a little bit different. And you might do that because it might help you to create a skewed view in your drawing somehow. Or maybe you're trying to lay something out, and it's not perfectly horizontal and perpendicular, but maybe it's on a weird angle, like 37 and a half degree angle. Well, that's kind of hard to do. You can create a user coordinate system or a UCS that is defined about that specific angle. So let's say that I have something that looks just like this. Very arbitrary, I'm just drawing it in. But when I turn on my ortho command, I try to draw lines because I want to draw them straight and perpendicular and parallel. I can't do that. I can't interact this way. So let's say I want to draw a line. It goes from here to over here. I have to turn off my ortho command, and I can't make it perfectly parallel or anything. What I would have to do is offset this a certain distance and then trim it and things like that. Well, that's a lot of extra effort. But what I can do is use my UCS. Now, what you want to do is make sure UCS follow. That's a command. And make sure that's set to 1. Now, when you set it, that's only saved per that drawing file. So it's only going to be in that file. So you can turn it on here, open up another file, and it might not be turned on. Another thing you probably are going to want to do is make sure your Visualize tab is turned on in your ribbon. If it isn't, just click on anywhere on these ribbon tabs, 
go to show tabs and go to visualize. So it probably looks something like this. It's not in here. But if you right click, go to show tabs and click on visualize, that will turn it on. And here you have a lot of coordinate system things that you can work with to manipulate our coordinate systems. Here this shows the UCS icon at the origin. That's what I'm doing right here. This is the UCS icon. Now I can customize the UCS very easily just by clicking on things right here. So if I can click on this and drag it to right here, snap to that point, I've created a new UCS. Now I can rotate it and now I've created a new UCS. Now I haven't changed the file any. Everything is still back relative to the world coordinate system. But now when I draw a line and I turn on my F8 button, these lines are parallel. This line and this line are parallel. These two lines are parallel because I defined my UCS according to this line here. Now I can change it again, flip it around there. I can move this over here, flip that around. It allows you to work differently. Now, if I want to reset everything, I just come to this bottom button here on my X and Y coordinate on my icon and click on world. And it resets it back to my world coordinate system. Now, to kind of show you that my 0, 0, is going to stay there, even though I change it, I'm going to draw a circle. I'm going to put it at coordinates of 0, 0. So there it is right there. I'm just going to give this a radius of 10 units. So at this circle is the origin of my world coordinate system. Now, when I change this again, and I can change this, and this easiest way to change your UCS is really just by grabbing the icon itself. Or you can also come up to these controls on the coordinates panel. Any of these here will rotate about a certain axis. You can rotate about the X or Y or Z axis. This command here will take you back to a previous used coordinate system. This will allow you to redefine the origin. You can change it about an X axis or by a three point axis. So you can do a lot of different things with all of these controls here. I can even go to specific types of UCS that are pre-saved like world. But the easiest way to change your UCS is to just grab your icon, click move in a line. So I can grab it here and then done. Hey, see, this was my origin point zero, zero. But if I draw a line and I go to point zero comma zero, it's going to start down here now, not up here. This is at a different set of coordinates now because we're using a different coordinate system. And now I can more easily work with this line work right here. And then when I'm finished, Again, I just type in UCS and I have different options here, but I click on world and it puts me back to my world coordinate system. Now, let's say I changed my UCS and I want to save this. Well, if I go to my UCS manager or UCS man, I can type that in or I can click right here. It allows me to save these things. So I have this unnamed one. I right click on it and I say rename. I'm just going to say UCS number one. Click OK. I can set it current. So now when I come up here to my coordinate system, I can go back to the world coordinate system, or I can very easily or quickly toggle to my UCS01, getting me back to where I was. And then my line work has changed. If I xref a file back into here or reference this file into another one, they'll still reference correctly. If I copy or paste an object from one file to another, they'll still come in to the same coordinates at the proper rotation. This just allows you to kind of, if you're drawing on the board or on a table, it's like grabbing your sheet of paper you're drawing on and just rotating it slightly, moving it around to get a different angle so that you can still draw on it properly. So UCS options are fantastic. It's a great way to help you get a different view to help you work at it. Now, you can also do this if you're cutting a viewport of a drawing and you want to rotate the view. This is another way to do it very quickly and easily. Also, the nice thing about this is that when I go to annotate something, I want to throw some dimensions on. I don't have my scale settings set up correctly for here, but what it does is it allows it to follow them properly. So if I change my UCS here and I rotate it and I throw a dimension on here, that'll really help. Now, if I go back to my visualize tab and go to world coordinate systems, you'll see my dimensions here still follow because they are created according to that UCS and I can dimension things a little bit easier if they're at an angle. So there are a lot of different reasons to create and use a custom user coordinate system, or UCS. We'll help you work with or visualize your lines, your data, your drawings in a different angle. 